It's a real honor to be, I'm going to say, back here. It's actually five years since I last addressed this great plenary, so uh, honored and pleased to be back. A lot of it has been happening. So I'm going to try and kick things off with a few remarks about where the, probably it's more on the demand side, where is it all going to go? Um, and just to frame this, what is the moment in history, and we've had a whole day on this, um, but I, put, I call it the great clean energy acceleration where we actually stand today. You know, we've had the great price spike coming out of COVID, uh, inflation spike, et cetera, we've all been living through. And of course, uh, as Maxim Timchenko talk, kicked us off yesterday, talking about this appalling invasion of Ukraine and it's had in, uh, implications across the energy space. But we're now in the great clean energy acceleration. And when I, stood up here, wasn't here, it was in Florence, five years ago, 2019, before all of that, if any of you can remember what the world was like, I showed this. This was the amount of money going into renewable energy assets since the day I started New Energy Finance, as was then, now Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And you sort of saw two periods. You saw a period of rapid growth, and then you saw a stagnation of the funds flowing in globally. It stagnated at about $300 billion per year for about 10 years. And what I pointed out five years ago was that the amount of clean energy did not stagnate. That continued to grow, and you can see it up there. 188 gigawatts installed in 2019. So the money stalled, the amount didn't. And that's where we were five years ago. So fast forward to today, let's update it. Well, that stagnation of the money flowing into clean energy is over. This is the acceleration. The number of gigawatts no longer fits on the same scale. When you crunch the scale down, you get that. So half a terawatt globally installed last year. And that's what I call the great clean energy acceleration. Now, we're all in the electricity business, I understand. And where we are is over 15% globally, over 15% globally of electricity now comes from these funny technologies that many of us here remember being called alternative. 15%. And of course, in certain markets, it's way, way more than 15%. Texas, Denmark, Germany, serious economies, UK, Spain. And it's very disruptive because, of course, wind and solar appear when they want to and not necessarily when you want them to. And that has implications on pricing, the way prices are formed, etc., etc. And it's not going to stop. So this was Sultan Al Jaba at COP28 in Dubai. And in, at COP28, it was decided that renewable energy capacity would triple by 2030. And in case you think, well, they say many things at COP, and none of them are of any real relevance, because everybody then goes back to, in the case of Mr. Al Jaba, running an oil company, amongst other things. This is really significant, and it's going to happen. This is Fatih Birol, head of the International Energy Agency. And what he says, is that two and a half times growth, remember 15% now, two and a half times growth by 2030, tomorrow, happens with existing policies. You don't even need to do anything to try to meet the COP28 Sultan Al Jaba target. So this stuff is very real, and that growth that we've seen, the acceleration, is continuing. Now, I said it's disruptive. Here you can see spot prices going negative. The good news, the good news is it's not just Europe. It's actually happening in the US. And in fact, 
it's a feature, and I suspect we'll be talking about this quite a lot more, it's a feature of variable renewables that appear when they want to and not when you pull a switch and when you want them. So that's where we are and where we're told, were told a few years ago, we were in the age of gas. How do we keep the lights on? We're here to do lights on. How do we keep the lights on? The age of gas. The problem for the age of gas theory, for this dealing with this variability, is this. <laughs> Batteries, on a cost basis, have essentially caught up. In many markets of the world, if your problem is the evening peak, the answer is not necessarily a gas peaker anymore. It's a battery, even if there's no carbon price. And things getting really interesting there. Now, the other thing, I, would, I promised to talk about the demand side. Where is all this new electricity going to go? And I'm going to say, I'm going to broadly talk about three areas, transport, heating, and industry. Transport, heating, and industry. Huge opportunities, by the way, for all of us and for everybody out there. So let's do transport first. Here you see the growth of electric cars by region. The percentage over there on the left, you can see, I think China, so far this year, it's been over 40% of all the cars being sold have plugs. Europe a little bit further behind, the US trailing. But still, over 10%. And this has been a very recent development. And you can see some of the European countries there on the, on the right of that, really getting to very high penetrations. Now, in the press, there's lots of talk about a slowing down, a pulling back. It's not a pulling back on electric vehicles. It's actually a pushing back. It's a pushing back largely because the Western manufacturers have messed up their product cycle, their model cycle. They all went for expensive cars with more and more range to get people like us to go take them on our holidays. Meanwhile, in China, they went down and did cheap, functional cars for commuting, shorter distances maybe, but really cheap and, crucially, really good. Better connectivity, better aerodynamics, better displays. Now, in the first session yesterday, we heard about Europe. It started off with sobering moment for Europe. And it is a sobering moment, not just for Europe. This is exports of cars. China going from half a million exports to four million exports in, what is that, three years? So this narrative that electric vehicles are not happening is not just nonsense. It's dangerous nonsense. Now, it's not just cars. This is Patrick Pouyanné, CEO of Total. And he testified to the French Senate, and he said something very interesting. We decided to invest in a European network of hydrogen filling stations for HGVs, one of the areas where people most hold out hope for hydrogen, as other areas prove not to be particularly easy and to be very expensive, but trucks, heavy goods vehicles. And he says, I'm not sure we got it right. I think electricity is going to carry the day because of progress on batteries and light vehicles. And there you see the models of trucks. This is not about Tesla or Hyzon or, or Nikola. This is about DAF and Daimler and Volvo and Scania. And if they don't get their act together and really bring those things to the markets, it will be about BYD and others. And that up there, you know, I'm so convinced that's the uh, HGV charging business, which I have spun up and created, Pragma Charge, to take advantage of this trend. Heating. Now you get a similar sort of pattern. This last few years, dramatic acceleration in heating, heat pumps. This is Europe. Is there a slowdown this year? Maybe there is a bit. We need to skill up. We need to work on the supply chains, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But have no doubt, this is happening. And there you see some of the European countries. 
Very interesting. In the UK, I come from the UK, and in the UK, we think heat pumps don't work. We go to restaurants with heat pumps, offices with heat pumps, but we're convinced that heat pumps don't work for some extraordinary reason. And we haven't really noticed that the colder the country, the more they believe that heat pumps work. This is the US. It's not just a European phenomenon. In the US, more heat pumps are being sold now than gas furnaces. Industry, because it's not just domestic heat pumps, it's also all about industrial heat. The third thing, transport, heating, and industry. I want to talk first about this piece, low temperature heat. Low temperature is up to 200 degrees. It's heat and it's steam. It's 45% of industrial heat demand. That's the easy bit. Why is it easy? Again, it's heat pumps. 200 degrees and steam. Food industry, the sugar industry, the nylon industry, there's all sorts of areas of industry. 45% of industrial demand falls to heat pumps, and it will fall quickly, as quickly as the supply can manage and the transmission. It also works for this. Many of you have got an involvement in combined heat and power. One of the reasons why it was hard to get off Russian gas we needed to use it in our power stations because we needed the heat to heat our cities. The electricity we could get elsewhere, but not the heat. We need a source of heat for those district heat networks. Heat pumps is one of the potential solutions for that. The high temperature heat pumps if the network is a high temperature network. And it's not just heat pumps, it's not just the 45%, it's the other 55% too. All the way up, the temperature scale right to the top. People say, oh, you can't use electricity for very high temperature heat, it doesn't work. Excuse me, arc welding, hello? All temperatures can fall to industrial, to electrified industrial heat. The challenge actually is that gas is really cheap. That's the challenge. There are no technical challenges other than the fact that gas is mispriced where it doesn't have to pay for carbon emissions. What we're talking about is in Europe, 78% of industrial emissions could be eliminated by electrification with existing technologies. It can go to 99% with some R&D. But right now, today, things you can buy from a catalog could do 80% of industrial decarbonization in Europe. I want to finish with four implications. First of all, we have no choice. You can see we talk a lot about decarbonizing electricity. And I started by saying we've got the great acceleration. 15% is already wind and solar. Globally, around 40% is renewable if you add in, um, is, zero, is zero carbon if you add in hydro and you add in nuclear, you get to, uh, uh, Ashford, you probably have better statistics than me. A lot is already clean and it's increasing and that's good. And you can see all the scenarios show it continues. A net zero scenario, more challenging, vastly more, but nevertheless, we are headed for a low carbon electricity system. Good. But we don't get to net zero without also electrifying. And Sasha, you started us off on this track. You said it's got to be 50% by, or 50 to 70% by 2050. It's got to be much higher even by 2040 in Europe. We will not decarbonize our economy because electricity is only 20%, 23% of final demand. We will not get there without lights on electrification, heat, transport, industry. Second implication, we have no choice. This is the share of clean energy technologies that is owned by China. Wind at the top, metal refining, all those critical minerals, batteries, and solar. If we don't get this right, we don't have an industrial future in Europe. It's really, really simple. 
Third implication, we've all seen this. Oh, it, the transition's too difficult. It's too difficult. Look at this. It's so hard, and this little bit at the top is renewable and clean, and, and it's just too hard. This is primary energy demand. I call it demand because that's what the IEA calls it. It's not demand. That's supply. Two-thirds of what they call demand in primary energy demand actually is waste thermal output from coal, gas, and actually also nuclear power stations, and uh, at the back of car exhausts. So what happens is, if you go from, I'll give you three examples, if you go from an incandescent light bulb powered by a coal-fired power station, and you go to an LED powered by solar on your roof or from the grid, then you have a 95% reduction in primary energy demand, demand in inverted commas. Transport, take your Volkswagen diesel and go to the exact same car, electric, 75% reduction. Your boiler, get rid of it, go to a heat pump, 78% reduction in this thing called primary energy demand. I call this the primary energy demand fallacy. It's a fallacy that clean energy, renewables, has to replace wasted heat out of coal and gas and nuclear power stations. The challenge is about 40% of the total that's on that enormous soaring chart. This is a good implication. This is going to be much easier than we think. And finally, this is using the data from the Grids for Speed report. If you haven't downloaded it, please download it. You can do it on the app. That's your past. As members of Euroelectric, that's your past. We've all grown up in an era when electricity demand was not growing. In fact, it was shrinking. It peaked in the UK in 2005. That is your future. This is a good implication of what we're talking about. We have to adjust our mentality to understand we are now operating in an industry of growth. And that has implications across the board, talent, finance requirement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I will leave it there. I look forward to the conversation. So do I. Michael, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.